Well, good morning and hello, kids, and welcome to season four and episode number 423 of the Daily Beaver Morning Show. No, 422, sorry, of the Daily Beaver Morning Show here on the Cryer Media Network. Yeah. <laughs> Today, recording day, is Wednesday, July 10th, 2024. And uh, it hasn't started yet, but according to Environment Canada, it is going to be a rather, rather rainy day here at the Beaver Lodge as uh, we start uh, getting some of the aftermath uh, of, well, the aftermath of Hurricane Barrel. It is Hurricane Barrel, so it's not actually its aftermath, but uh, as it's uh, coming across uh, our way. Uh, it seems that weather has shifted from uh, last evening forecasts and that there are certain parts in Ontario that might be missed. Um, but uh they're calling on substantial amounts of rain here. Uh, I'm looking here at uh, the latest warning from the Weather Network, and it says here, periods of heavy rainfall associated with the remnants of Hurricane Barrel, remnants is the word I was looking for, will move into southern Ontario this morning. These types of weather systems can give very high rainfall rates in torrential downpours. Rainfall amounts will likely be highly variable across the region, and some areas may receive in excess of 80 millimeters, which is uh, up from yesterday, because I think yesterday they were predicting a maximum of 50, particularly for areas close to the St. Lawrence River. Rain will taper to scattered showers Thursday morning. For information concerning flooding, please consult your local conservation authority or Ontario Ministry of Natural Resources and Forestry Office. Uh, this is, of course, uh, the downpour for a region in Ontario. Um, I'm not sure uh, if there will be rain. Well, yes, I know that there will be rain in Atlantic Canada uh, because uh, I saw that on in an article on CTV, if I'm not mistaken, uh, with regards to Hurricane Barrel. Uh, let me just find it for you here on my phone. Um, boom, boom, boom. Yes, uh, declared a tropical depression. Barrel continued moving through the United States Midwest on Tuesday. Heavy rains and downpours from the storm are forecast to arrive in southern Ontario and parts of southern Quebec Tuesday night and Wednesday. Rainfall warnings issued by Environment Canada span much of southern Ontario into the eastern Quebec townships of Quebec. The alerts caution on rain totals of 40 to 80 millimeters with a risk of flash flooding due to downpours. Um, and then uh, heat and humidity in the Maritimes are creating ideal conditions for thunderstorms. Isolated thunderstorms are expected in the region Tuesday afternoon and night. Severe thunderstorm watches were issued by Environment Canada for thunderstorm producing rainfall rates of up to 25 millimeters per hour in parts of Nova Scotia on Tuesday. Heat warnings are likely to continue for parts of the Maritimes into Wednesday. Um, and that's uh, what I've got there. What else do we have? As the remnants of barrel move through southern Ontario, it will combine with a weather front moving in from the west. The merge system will then bring rounds of rain and showers in the Maritimes Wednesday night and Thursday. Environment Canada issued a special weather statement for both New Brunswick and Prince Edward Island. The weather agency cautioned that while intermittent, the additional moisture as a result of barrel increases the risk of heavy rainfall rates. They go on to state the system is being monitored and rainfall warnings may be required. No statement related to barrel had been issued for Nova Scotia as of Tuesday afternoon. The province could have more showery conditions Wednesday night and Thursday. There may still, may still be a risk of isolated downpours and thunderstorms, especially for northern and eastern areas, including Cape Breton. Um, so there you go. Just wanted to, to get that information out to you as soon and as early as possible. Uh, good morning to you, Kit Elaine. Thank you for being able to join us in uh, the chat here, uh, even though we are, Kits and Cubs, in a bit of a unique situation, which I will tell you about after I do finish the intro all the way. By thanking our podcast founding sponsors, The Pepper Master, The Misfy Mysteries from Corvin Moon Publishing, and CanadianTarot.com. Ah, uh, Miss Shadika, hello. Good morning to you too as well. And uh, please uh, wish uh, Kit Jazzy a belated happy birthday on my behalf. Uh, I hope that the day was as beaverific as she is. <laughs> uh, 
So there we go. Um, so that's uh, the weather stuff. Um, as you may notice, we are starting uh, a little late today, Kits and Cubs, and thank you so much for your patience. And we are not starting in our usual venue or platform. Uh, and that is because uh, we do not have Mr. Grizzly today. Uh, I do not know why we don't. Um, I assume uh, he is still sleeping uh, because uh, committing to get up at five o'clock in the morning, five days a week uh, on your vacation week um, was quite ambitious. So, uh, and uh, so I would fully suspect and would not be surprised whatsoever uh, that he was tired. He's really earned this vacation. So uh, I am definitely not going to begrudge him getting some extra sleep and it's not like it hasn't happened to me you know <laughs> uh kit toronto dan kit mr jim lovely to see you thank you so much yes exactly kit elaine how dare he sleep during vacation <laughs> Ah, you are wonderful, kids and cubs. Thank you so much. Um, but yes, uh, I am hoping that that is indeed the case, however, because um, in the news, uh, is, you may have heard that um, in Alberta, it would seem that uh, the ban on grizzly bear hunting has been reversed. Now, I don't know about you kids, um, but um, Mr. Grizzly goes to Alberta. Then all of a sudden, the ban on grizzly hunting is reversed. And then the following Monday, following day, we have no Mr. Grizzly. I'm not saying... But Daniel Smith, bitch better have my grizzly. <laughs> oh, man. It seems that uh, the species, it, though it is in danger, uh, there are provincial regulations now allow small groups of hunters to shoot and kill grizzlies. There are conditions among uh, them. So, for example, uh, the bears have to be considered some type of problem. Um this decision has not make it made everybody happy, of course. Uh, Todd Lowen, Alberta's Ministry of Forestry and Parks, says that the grizzly bears are a big problem in the province. Uh, the, there were two hikers and a dog that were killed by a grizzly bear near Banff last fall, and grizzlies were also blamed for the loss of 22 sheep and lambs on the southern Alberta ranch this spring. Uh, Minister Lowen, Lowen says that the province needs to make changes and it's really about responding to rural Albertans and their concerns. So the new regulations will uh, end an 18-year prohibition on hunting grizzlies. The government will issue permits based on a lottery system, and hunters will be given a specific date, range, and region with the objective of killing bears that are causing problems to people and livestock. Um, how exactly it is going to be determined uh, which bears are causing problems uh, is not particularly um, clear at this moment. So that's a bit of a concern. Um, but hopefully there will be more details coming uh, with uh, that. Uh, conservationists are worried because if we're talking about grizzly bears, uh, that might be a... Uh, threat to humans of course because you know we're encroaching on their space and reducing their habitat um that the best thing to do is to uh have a an appropriate wildlife official who's professional who is trained to deal with these circumstances um rather than trying to um do a lottery system where hunters can sort of take care of it themselves. Uh, so yes, um, that's what's being said there by, by members of the Conservation Society. Uh, they're saying that uh, 
they uh, are the best informed on the topic uh, and uh, would best know how to handle it. Grizzly bears were declared a threatened species in 2010 when they numbered about 700 in Alberta. The province says they are now more than 1,100, which I'm guessing they're using that as a justification to say that, you know, a little hunting is okay. Um, but yeah, that is what's going on there with regard to that. And I am definitely hoping, uh, like I said, that uh, they were able to distinguish between our Mr. Grizzly. <laughs> But uh, yeah, just interesting that that uh, it, it seems that it shocked a lot of people because there seemed to be no warning whatsoever that this decision was going to be made. Um, so we'll, we'll see what happens there um, as well. Uh, so I do not have the benefit of clips for you again today, unfortunately. Uh because that's what I had, uh, because the Prime Minister is at uh, NATO, the Leaders' Conference in Washington, D.C., for the 75th anniversary. And um, yesterday he was able to give a keynote address. And the reason I wanted to present it was because uh, one of the complaints that we hear from the far right uh, who are anti-everything and assume that everything in Canada is broken, is that Canada is not respected on the world stage. And, of course, we are, right? Uh, the Prime Minister's longevity and success as a statesman uh, make it such that we're now at the point that he'll often be asked to be the first to speak about something or the second to speak about something if something's, you know, specifically related to another nation or to deliver these types of keynote address addresses because he's among the group. He's considered one of the elder statesmen. And this happened again in Washington, D.C. And he delivered a speech. And it seems that uh, there is a center of excellence with regard to climate change and global security which is being established. NATO has uh, seemed to agree that this is the case. Now, when it comes to climate change, and this is going to provoke a lot of people from going, oh, the prime minister went to NATO to talk about climate change. Oh, my God. Woke, 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 woke. Um, there is nobody more, quote, unquote, woke than the military and the people that look after the national security uh, of the nation and do all the analysis than the issue of climate change. Uh, we mentioned it on the show probably a few years ago uh, with regard to, to uh, migration, uh, climate-based migration, as there's lack of food, as there's lack of water, as heat becomes too much. And uh, there's only going to be so much that people can do uh, to, quote-unquote, maintain their borders or defend the borders because uh, people need to drink and people need to eat and people need to get out of the sun and people have a survival instinct. That's just human nature. Uh, but that was going that that stuff is going to cause security concerns. Will there be wars for water? Will there be wars for land on which stuff still grows? You know, um, they're all things that they have to consider. So um, when it comes to national security, when it comes to global security, when it comes to national defense uh, issues, related to climate are definitely front and center and have been for a long time with regard uh, in the uh, in the estimation of the military. Let's put it that way. So the prime minister was there, and this was an initiative that Canada has been spearheading, and uh, it has been established. And uh, I guess it was sort of the inauguration of the... Not, I don't know if the center is opening right now or that it is, you know, everything has been approved and now the work on starting it is going to, to happen. But he was there to announce that. And it was fairly well received, which is a good now. It's probably a preaching to the choir audience as, you know, all the members of NATO has just have determined that this is a place that they should go. And now it's happening. So, right but it seemed to be well-received uh, at uh, 
uh, at that point. Um, we have here a comment from a Kit Jim that says uh, the USAF, that's the U.S. Air Force, I would assume, has been looking at synthetic fuels for a long time, which is a uh, yes, absolutely true, absolutely true. Um, so the Prime Minister was there, and uh, he outlined Canada spending plans as. And uh, made the case for Canada, uh, reminding NATO members that uh, under the previous government, Canada was at 0.97% of GDP, and that the federal government had made a commitment to do better on that and has followed through. We're at 1.33, and we have a plan to 1.76 by uh, the end of this decade, by 2029. Um NATO members appear to want a plan specifically for getting to 2%. Um, I'm not sure what value that plan would have, uh, given that we're, you know, I mean, 2029 is already five years away. And, uh, you know, with the number of changes of changes of government and stuff like that that can happen in the meantime, a government planning for the next five years as in one year left in the mandate and they assume they will win the next one and this is what they want to intend to do and they want to send some signals is one thing um but i'm not sure i mean i'm sure it would make a lot of people feel good but i'm not sure what what real worth that plan would have uh past five years now uh melanie jolie has stated explicitly to NATO members that Canada, without saying Canada will eventually hit 2%, uh, specifically in those words, that that's definitely uh, becoming more of a priority and a goal that we wish to reach. And so has Defense Minister Mel Bill Blair. So uh, according to U.S. Ambassador to Canada, David Cohen, he personally feels quite satisfied uh, by the fact that that is happening. And as I mentioned on yesterday's show, that the amount of money going out the door uh, this year is going up by about 27% from previous years. And that's with about a 3 to 5% increase in the overall defense budget. So that means uh, more money is going out the door actually being spent. And when you add that to the fact that Canada now does seem to have commitments to uh, spend at least 20% of its defense budget on actual procurement and things of the like. Um, that this is, things are improving uh, with regard to where our standing is on 2% specifically. Um, but there was still a work to do on that front. So the prime minister, had some meetings uh, with some U.S. senators, uh, I believe, because in, I think it was last spring, uh, yes, last spring, uh, there was about 23 U.S. lawmakers that uh, I think wrote an open letter and called on the prime minister to meet the NATO defense spending. Uh, so he did meet a bipartisan group of senators. Uh, Trudeau also met with Hakeem Jeffries, who's the Democratic minority leader in the House of Representatives. Um, so that happened. Um, the speech he delivered was delivered uh, at the Canadian Embassy in Washington specifically. Uh, so uh, that was kind of nice that uh, everybody uh, came to our space in Washington to hear that. Um, and I believe that the meeting is being held in Washington uh, rather than New York or something. Well, first of all, NATO is not the UN, but uh, Washington, D.C., I believe, is where uh, documents were signed uh, 75 years ago when NATO was established, and this is the 75th anniversary of NATO. So I actually believe they might even, even, even be in the same location as where the documents were signed for uh, the majority events uh, or the, the bigger events of uh, the next three days that are there. Um, Canada's ambassador to the U.S., Kristen Hillman, 
has uh, tried, according to CBC, has tried to smooth the way for the Prime Minister and get a sense of how upset the members of Congress really are. Uh, once again, reminding that it's not the issue of just focusing on a number because, you know, everybody's a sophisticated country and they understand uh, nuance and the fact that there are many policies uh, that contribute not only to the homeland security of each of the nations, but the security of the world itself. Um, in Ottawa, the finance minister, Christian Freeland, echoed uh, the prime minister's defense of NATO by saying, quote, we recognize the threats in the world and in the budget that I tabled in April, we put forward a fully costed plan to get our defense spending up to nearly 1.8% in 2029. But it's still not the 2% like we said, so it's a bit of a sticking point. Um, a man named Eldridge Cole, Colby, uh, who could be Donald Trump's national security advisor, should he um, become leader for the next administration, uh, says that at this point, given the way that uh, things in the world are shifting, it should be uh, beyond, quote, quote, beyond a wake-up call for nations to have a plan to achieve 2%. Uh, kind of odd considering that one of the big fears uh, of Trump becoming president again is that he might try to somehow withdraw or sabotage NATO. Uh, so to hear someone who could be his national security advisor actually making the case for everybody paying their 2% is a, a little dissonant for me. But he said, uh, Colby said, while he's not speaking for Trump, he says that there have to be consequences for Canada not meeting NATO targets, and the go-softly approach of the Biden administration has to end. So that's about their positions over there. Uh, with regard to Canada, uh, the leader of the opposition, Pierre Polyèvre, um, tried to make a little hay on this, uh, by talking about his vision for Canada's military. Uh, he's calling for a cultural shift and new spending. Uh, so um, he did this in a video about his Quebec road trip. And uh, he says uh, he uh, was talking to a journalist in BC recently and said that if he became prime minister, he'd end what he calls woke culture. So I don't know if he plans to, uh, for example, copy Donald Trump's policy of uh, trying to eliminate transgender people from the military, for example. But I don't know exactly what he says about walk culture specifically. But with regard to Canada, uh, given that we have had uh, a lot of focus on some of the challenges facing the forces, such as, for example, um, uh, all the stuff with regard to uh, sexual assault and uh, harassment, for example. Um, his point of view would be that we've been spending too much time trying to address those types of things and uh, not enough making sure that our military has a warrior mentality. <clears throat> yes. The um, obsession with projecting strength, also one of the 14 characteristics of fascism. Uh, yeah. I'm not sure if that comment was needed on that day, but yeah. So uh, he says that there's a need to rebalance uh, the narrative around our armed forces. Again, more focus on a warrior mentality. Um, but if we fixate on the military's core capabilities, so spending on things like fighter jets and tanks, uh, he says that he will work towards meeting the 2% commitment. So he's trying, trying to do a little grandstanding here. So I'll do what uh, they, they haven't been committed to yet. Um, his problem with saying that, however, is that he also wants to balance the budget. So I'm not sure how you get us from 1.33 to 2%. Um, I'm assuming when you say you're doing it, you're, you're mean that you're also going to be doing it by 2029. And um, 
maintain the services and balance the budget. So if he's planning to do all of that, uh, then the cuts to programs and services are going to be massive because uh, it is multiple tens of billions of dollars that would be required in order to be able to get us to 2%. And then when you add the fact that since we don't have the capacity to get that money out of the door, uh, there would be a lot of hiring, a lot of staffing, uh, when he also made a commitment to reduce the size of the public service. So he kind of has these promises that he's going to be everything to everyone, and a lot of them are contradictory, and uh, a lot of them are such that both can't happen at the same time uh, unless he's prepared to make a lot of people cry. Uh, yeah. Not... Uh, each of these policy planks can sound good to someone who is more conservative leaning um, on the surface in isolation. But once you take them all together, it's like, well, how do they work? Right. The, the fam best example of that I, that I always have is uh, the election that brought Trudeau into power when Tom Mulcair had a whole suite of policies that were like that. He had a, a child care policy uh, that he was pushing but he was really trying to save Fortress Quebec that already had a child care program and there was no additional benefit for it with regard to this program. And then also by trying to maintain Fortress Quebec, he then signed the Sherbrooke, well, said he supported the Sherbrooke Declaration, which said that 50% plus one vote would, all, would be all it would take for Quebec to be able to declare separation, which is um, different than that which the Clarity Act says. It's a lower threshold. Than, what one, than one would assume the one offered by the Clarity Act is. And why I say one would assume is because the Clarity Act says that it has to be a clear result on a clear question, but doesn't define what clear result and clear question is. So you could, def you could hold a referendum being compliant with the Clarity Act and still saying 50% plus one vote is for our purposes considered a clear result. But that type of wording usually suggests something like, you know, a 60% or two thirds or something, something that's a little higher um, because separating from a country is a really big deal. So um, sometimes you want a higher threshold and we've had seen that before uh, in referenda on uh, changing the voting system to proportional representation uh, in the provinces. Often some of them have had, like, for example, you need to get 60% of the vote or you need to get an over a majority of the vote, but in, uh, you know, two thirds of the electoral districts. Uh, so, you know, so it's, it wasn't never, it wasn't, it wasn't ever a straight, just 50% plus one vote. It was always a little higher standard because we were talking about something so fundamental to democracy as how we chance, how we, how we count the votes. So everybody assumed that it, well, everybody assumed those who fought for that side of the argument made the case successfully, I guess, that the threshold had to be higher. That's also a tactic, however, to make sure that the policy doesn't uh, take place or doesn't get voted in uh, if it's something that you don't want, which was the case, as we heard recently in Ohio, for example, when they were about to have a, uh, 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 the choice uh, initiative put on the ballot uh, when it became very clear that it was going to go on the ballot then the, the government over there tried to pass a law to say uh, had people uh, sorry, created another ballot that went on went in before the one that they were going to vote on on abortion because that one's going to happen during the election trying to say hey yeah, are you okay with us uh, the people that you elected to represent you, making it such that if you actually want us to do what you say you want, we need 60% of you to approve it henceforth rather than 50. Would you be willing to cede that power as citizens to us so that we can better rule you? And citizens said, uh, no. <laughs> So yeah, it's uh, that type of initiative to try and uh, get people to agree to make, uh, to make the threshold higher. Um, so yeah, 
Um, I mean, I can understand why the leader of the opposition decided to come out uh, with that uh, on that day. I mean, the timing of the 75th anniversary and whatnot, it's a, you know, communications wise, it, it's smart to do that. Uh, it's just that he didn't seem to have much to say other than I will, I, I will do better. I will spend the 2% and uh, all that woke stuff. We don't need to do that anymore. Um, which is uh, considering that some of that woke stuff, like we talked about is uh, sexual assault and sexual harassment, uh, principally of uh, female members of our uh, armed services or female identifying members of our armed services. Um, not exclusively, far from exclusively, actually, uh, but primarily. Um, kind of right in line with the MGTOW hashtag, isn't it? To want to campaign on that. So, yeah, kind of tracks. Uh, unfortunately. <laughs> Now, um, interestingly, there's another little side thing that has happened um, where Pierre Polyev had a lot to say about what he would do if he were prime minister in order to adjust or change or bring our military into the next century. Um, but he apparently had very, 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 very little to say about the fact that it seems to be more and more confirmed based on analysis uh, from the UN that Russia decided to blow up a children's hospital in Ukraine. Um, the leader of opposition has been pretty silent on that. Uh, we've had Michael Chung uh, come out with a tweet at some point saying that conservatives, uh, again, not Canadians, but conservatives um, are standing with Ukraine somehow. Um, I'm not sure exactly how they're doing that um, because with the Conservative Party, the words and the deeds are not aligning once again when it comes to that uh, we saw the example of that when it came to negotiating free trade um where under some flimsy premise of uh, not wanting to expand uh climate policy ideology um he had to stand against it he had to uh determine from the opposition benches of canada what was best for Ukraine. Again, once again, uh, Ukraine, even though you say you want this, um, you be quiet. We'll tell you what you want. We're your betters. Um, but yes, Michael Chong specifically tweeted, conservatives condemn Russia for attacking civilians in Ukraine, including a children's hospital that has left, that has left at least 29 dead and more than 100 injured. Conservatives will continue to support Ukraine against Russia's illegal war. To which I, I wrote him, you mean Canadians condemn, don't you? Or are conservatives either not Canadians or somehow a distinct class that needs to be spoken for individually on something like this? Um, so yeah, um, but the leader of the opposition had nothing to say. And the reason for that could potentially have something to do with the fact that, uh, the prime minister of India, Narendra Modi is in Moscow meeting with Vladolf Putler. Um, Yeah. And uh, it's not like bad boy Vlad doesn't have a bit of a track record of launching this type of attack, a spectacular attack, one that will get the world's uh, tongues wagging uh, just as a NATO's leader summit pops up. It's like, yeah, we know that you have your agenda, but hell yeah, let me just go globe 
blow up this children's hospital so I can, uh, yeah, make sure that you talk about us. Upend your agenda a little bit. So, yeah. Uh, and, of course, uh, it's not like the Conservative Party of Canada. Um, apparently, according to the Ensacop report at least, has hands totally clean when it comes to the participation of India, particularly in its leadership races. So uh, we have a party that's been accused, rightly or wrongly, fairly or unfairly, of carrying uh, water for Putin, trying to help him out by trying to block Ukraine's accession to the EU because the EU would demand that Ukraine has higher climate standards to meet its own in order to be able to accede to the Union. Uh, and uh, he was the first to accuse the Prime Minister of actually having nothing on Modi when the Prime Minister revealed to the nation in the House of Commons that uh, the government of India may have been involved in uh, an extrajudicial judicial killing of a Canadian on Canadian soil. Uh, and now, as the Prime Minister is meeting leaders at NATO, and Volodymyr Zelensky is there, um, Putin bombs the hospital, and the leader of the opposition has nothing to say about it. But has people from this party saying that conservatives condemn this violence. Not Canadians, but conservatives do. Okay. <laughs> um, so Modi arrived. Uh, he touched down in Moscow. According to the CBC, climbed into a golf cart that was driven by the Prussian president. Uh, this visit, it seems, is uh, very important to the Russian president himself because it uh, helps him counter the narrative that Russia is being isolated. Uh, I mean, Prime Minister Modi, I mean, India is a big country, and Prime Minister Modi is a significant leader uh, on the global stage. So uh, it definitely... Um, there's definitely an avenue for Putin to be able to push that narrative, uh, to push that good image, uh, basically boast, uh, you know, the West is trying to crush us uh, by making us a pariah. But look, see, people are still coming to visit, important people. So it's not working. These uh, attempts are futile, and the West would be best served by just stopping them. Uh, Alexis Zahara from the Moscow-based expert on South Asia says... Quote, when it comes to the war in Ukraine, India tries to take a neutral, pragmatic stance. Um, for India, it's an imperative to continue this multi-alignment policy where it tries to maximize its benefits from different relationships. In the past two years, India has been buying billions of dollars worth of discounted oil from Moscow, and the country is the biggest importer of Russian weaponry. Now, while Modi hasn't explicitly called out Moscow over the war, in remarks, he did lament the death of children, which is kind of ironic. I'm not sure in the timeline uh, whether or not the lamenting the death of children was a sort of motherhood statement that was made before the hospital was bombed or after the hospital was bombed, knowing that so many children died. And uh, so, but uh, if it was before, That'd be uh, add some color and texture to the move by the Russian government, allegedly, to bomb that hospital now, wouldn't it? Modi comes in. Oh, the West's attempt to isolate us are not working. Hello, my friend. Hello, my friend. Kiss, kiss. Yes, let's talk. Oh, well, you know, because I still want weapons from you and I still want cheap oil, so I'm not going to condemn you. Uh, doing things uh, in Ukraine that I would uh, not tolerate uh, people in Kashmir doing in India, for example. Uh, but I will just lament the death of so many children. And then Putin goes, hey, great idea.
that would add some color and texture. Uh, so yes, I do not know in the timeline where that event, uh, where those events happened. Uh, but yes, whether it's before or after um, the hospital uh, bombing took place, that would uh, change the narrative a lot <laughs> with regard. Um, Ukraine says that the hospital was hit by Russian cruise missile and released photos showing fragments. The UN is, seems to be confirming uh, that based on, on its anal anal based on its analysis. But Russia claims that the building was hit by Ukraine's air defense system, offered no evidence as part uh, uh, to support that. Um, now, Putin awarded Modi with Russia's highest civilian honor to mark their friendship. Officials say they discussed, it, they discussed trade and security along with discussing what was going on in Ukraine. Indian officials say that Russia promised to release its citizens who have been, quote, misled into joining the military. It seems that there are a lot of uh, Indians uh, joining the Russian army allegedly without their knowledge. The way that this is kind of happening, they're giving the example of a man named Mohammed Imran. Um, who says that his brother moved from a city in India or a town in India to Moscow in the fall after being promised a security job. But shortly after, he was sent to the front line and was killed. So, yeah, apparently there are a few dozen Indian nationals in, who are in Ukraine fighting, and India has uh, warned, warned its citizens to be cautious when taking on work in Russia. Because uh, you could be invited to Russia to be a security guard. And next thing you know, you're being shipped to Ukraine. It would seem. Um, Modi must really want that oil and those weapons because uh, it's like, um, dude. I hear you've been taking some of our citizens and like, you know, telling them to come to your country for good jobs. And then you've been like whooping them out of the jobs and like putting them in your army, in your meat grinder. Uh, yeah, we can't have that. <laughs> <laughs> but instead it's like, no, everybody be careful when you accept jobs in Russia. Wink. Is all that he gets. But apparently he did manage to extract some type of commitment from Putin that uh, those soldiers, uh, involuntary soldiers, would be able to uh, return back home. We'll see. In other news, kids and cubs. Um, not sure if you watched the game last night, but uh, Copa America the big match between Canada and Argentina, the second time that Canada had the privilege of facing the world number one in a couple of weeks. They faced them in pool play. Uh, it was their first match in the round robin in pool play, and uh, Team Canada had lost 2-0, uh, but had been, um, uh, how would I say, uh, uh, praised for its performance, that it really held its own quite well playing against one of the world's, against the world's best team, I should say, not just one of them, right? So uh, they got to play them again. Unfortunately for Team Canada, and perhaps even predictably, uh, the score ended 2-0 again for Argentina. So Canada uh, no longer has a chance for the gold medal in the Copa America, but will still play on Saturday for the bronze medal. So uh, still important, I believe, against Colombia. Um, it was an uh, interesting game. It's there were uh, opportunities for Can there were some opportunities for Canada at the beginning, and Canada finished very, very strong. Uh, great fighting spirit, uh, never said die. Uh, near the end, there were two really nice opportunities, um, but for the better part of the match, Canada had only had only managed one clean uh, strike on goal. Uh, which was defended. Uh, that may be a testament to how good Argentina was uh, because at some point, uh, a little around the mid part of the game, 
um, I think, possession of the ball. Argentina had possession about 61% of the time. And uh, by the end of the match, uh, it seemed to uh, even out. So uh, Team Canada did do uh, quite well uh, playing there. Uh, Team Canada very clear, very, very, very closely got one past uh, the Argentinian, Argentinian netminder. Uh, that was uh, the first of the two great opportunities at the end. Actually did somewhat get past him, but uh, got snagged on his leg as it was going through and was stopped the momentum enough. Uh, that he was able to to make the full stop afterwards. And then the second opportunity, um, I'm pretty sure that the ball would have gotten past the netminder, but it was just slightly a little wide of the net, and uh, therefore it didn't happen. So Team Canada played very, very well. Uh, no need to hang their head in shame whatsoever. Uh, it was a great match. It was a great event. Uh, Team Canada is being talked about uh, worldwide at the moment uh, so that's definitely a big win particularly since the men's national team did not qualify for the olympics so this is their big moment at the moment and uh, they absolutely made the most of it first ever uh, participation in the copa america uh, which is a big tournament and uh, one of the biggest ones in the world in a non-world cup year and uh, you know ending in fourth fourth place at worst and put to potentially third. So uh, that's quite good. Uh, nothing, uh, a lot to celebrate there, and hopefully uh, the national team will be able to bring that momentum into what it is uh, going, uh, what it is doing next, because uh, the next World Cup, as you know, is being hosted on the, the North American continent, and there will be games in Canada. So uh, as a host nation, we definitely want uh, the opportunity, right, to uh, shine at home. So we'll see what happens there. Uh, in other news, uh, Kits and Cubs, uh, at uh, Wimbledon, um, all the Canadians, unfortunately, are out except for one, uh, which is our doubles player, uh, Gabriela Dabrowski, um, in doubles. Uh, unfortunately, in uh, mixed doubles, uh, the tennis gods were really, really, really cruel. Um, her regular doubles partner, say, you know, uh, women's doubles partner, Aaron Routliff, is currently the number one doubles player in the world. Dabrowski is currently the number three. Well, in the first round of mixed doubles, they were facing each other. <laughs> so, uh, yeah, uh, uh, she didn't win that one. Uh, because uh, Ratliff's partner, Michael Venus, is uh, one of the best uh, doubles players in the world as well uh, for men. So um, that was... Uh, and uh, her doubles partner, Hadi Helio Vada, who is a Grand Slam champion in doubles, uh, uh, I believe in mixed open, uh, 2023, uh, I believe as well, uh, US Open. Uh, but a new partnership for them, so uh, not a lot of time working together. And uh, whereas uh, Ratliff and Venus have played together for a good while. So um, that one was a, a little uh, uh, predictable. However, uh, in the actual full-out doubles, uh, Aaron Routliff and Gabriela Dabrowski uh, won their eighth of a final match uh, yesterday to advance to the quarterfinals. And uh, they have a pretty good draw at the moment. Uh, the next team that they have to face is a, is a very good team. Uh, Dabrowski and Routliff are the, the number two ranked team in the draw, and uh, they'll be playing Barbara Krejcikova, uh, who is, uh, again, a, a multiple Grand Slam winner in uh, doubles. And, um, pardon me, sorry, <clears throat> my mouth mm, got a little dry there. Hold on. Sorry, Barbara Krejcikova and Laura Sigmund, um, relatively new partnership uh, between them as well. So they might have a bit of an edge there, uh, just based on their experience placing together, uh, playing together. But if they can get past them, uh, they have a pretty clear path to the final. And uh, Routliff and Dabrowski are uh, Grand Slam doubles champions, having won the U.S. Open uh, women's title last year. Uh, both of them for their first one. So there you go. Some Canadians uh, to be proud of, and uh, I'm not sure when their next match is, um, but I don't think it's today. I think they might have the day off today. So um, 
that's uh congratulations to them for playing very well um a little uh, note uh kids and cubs about the um current heat that is going on um if you happen to be uh someplace where it's really warm uh and you happen to see uh, people who are homeless uh, who are sleeping on the pavement uh, please do check up on them because there is such thing as pavement burn uh, i remember last year uh, during the big heat uh, there was a lady in a wheelchair i believe uh, who had fallen out of it somehow and had been lying on the pavement for a couple of minutes before someone came to help her and she ended up having like a certain i'm not quite sure which degree if it was second or third but uh, big degree burns uh, on her body uh, from just uh, the pavement uh, because when it's uh, uh, this is data that I have unfortunately uh, in Fahrenheit uh, but I, I will try to uh, do that when it's uh, 120 Fahrenheit or something like that which is about uh, 48 degrees Celsius uh, pavement itself can be as high as 170 Fahrenheit which is 76 close to 77 degrees uh, Celsius. So, um, yeah, you uh, want to, if you can, uh, just pay attention to that because uh, people can get burned rather quickly. Now, of course, uh, we're not uh, picking up 170 Fahrenheit here in Canada uh, at the moment. You know, it's only about, uh, you know, 95. Uh, so, you know, 95 Fahrenheit is about 35 degrees Celsius. So we're talking about temperatures that are way higher that are closing in that are in the 40s and whatnot. Uh, but even at 35 uh, degrees Celsius, pavement can get very hot. So uh, just uh, keep that in, in mind, uh, you know, to uh, if you don't want to intervene personally, just make sure that, to, you know, you call some paramedics or something. And uh, uh, but yeah, uh, it's a... Uh, we have to look out for each other. And again, please uh, uh, make sure if you, there are elderly people in your neighborhood, in your, uh, you know, in your apartment building, uh, that you're checking up on them to make sure that they're staying hydrated. Uh, all right. Um, as you know, Kids and Cubs, uh, there is a strike in Ontario from the Liquor Control Board of Ontario uh, Union employees. Uh, yesterday, NDP leader Jagmeet Singh joined a picket line last night in Mississauga, Ontario, which is just west of Toronto, um, to, in order to uh, show some solidarity. Uh, the workers have been on strike since Friday, uh, and uh, Jagmeet sa said, quote, as leader of the New Democratic Party, I'm here to say, uh, sorry, I'm here to say, standing in solidarity with the workers, we demand. Oh, I, uh, for some reason, <laughs> I, uh, I had a typo uh, in the word. So, um, yes, I'm not quite exactly sure uh, what the quote says to the next word because it got mistyped. Sorry. Uh, but uh, they're demanding that... Uh, um, that the plan uh, towards privatization be backed away from. And uh, we demand that Doug Ford meet with these workers, negotiate properly, and give them a fair deal. So far, new, no new talks have been scheduled between the union and the Liquor Control Board of Ontario. Now, yesterday, there was something really interesting that happened because... Um, Well, first of all, I'm not sure if this one was yesterday, but uh, Lisa McLeod, who um, now is uh, the only MPP from the Ottawa region within the Ontario Progressive Conservative Party. Uh, Goldie Gamari used to be the other one, but uh, as we know, um, her conversation with Tommy Robinson uh, kind of changed her fortunes within the party. So yes, uh, but uh, Lisa McLeod um, was, how would I put it? Making it very clear that Ontarians who lived closer to the Quebec border 
could and make sure that all their alcohol needs were met by shopping cross-border. Which is a very interesting position for a member of the government to take with regard to a crown corporation that brings in about two and a half million dollars, not million, sorry, billion dollars per year into the Ontario coffers. It's like, hey, you know, you can just cross the border and buy it. You can just spend that Ontario money in Quebec and have all that benefit go to the SAQ and the Guadalamans Quebec rather than the one in Ontario. I'm recommending to you or reminding you as a former minister of the government of Ontario. Okay, weird. And then Doug Ford came up and uh, in his uh, effort to quote union bust, um, basically encouraged Ontarians to cross as many picket lines as possible uh, by printing an, a virtual map of where are all the places that you can get alcohol in Ontario, despite the strike, uh, according to an article uh, by Cryer Media, specifically. So, so yes, we're, we are quoting ourselves here, I guess. Um, Doug Ford's recent video promoting a new virtual map for alcohol purchases during the LCBO strike has sparked controversy and anger among various groups in Ontario. Here's a breakdown of the situation and the reactions it elicited. The Virtual Map Initiative. Premier Doug Ford unveiled a new interactive online map designed to help Ontario residents locate alternative retailers for beer, wine, cider, and spirits during the ongoing LCBO strike. The tool aims to connect customers with local Ontario-made products and support businesses affected by the LCBO closures. Timing and context. The launch of this digital tool comes at a sensitive time with around 9,000 LCBO workers currently on strike. Negotiations between the workers' union and the Crown Corporation have stalled with no further discussion scheduled. The government stance. Ford emphasized the MAP's role in supporting Ontario businesses and workers involved in producing and serving alcoholic beverages. The government is framing this as part of a broader plan to enhance consumer choice and convenience in alcohol purchases. Union concerns. The Ontario Public Service Employees Union, OPSU, representing the striking LCBO workers, has expressed serious concerns about the government's expansion plans for alcohol sales. They argue that allowing private retailers to sell alcohol could undercut prices and jeopardize thousands of jobs within communities. Political backlash. Opposition parties have criticized the government's priorities. The Liberals condemned the launch of the online map, contrasting it with ongoing health care challenges. NDP leader Merritt Stiles pledged to allocate LCBO revenue to bolster public services, if in power. And public reaction. The video and map launch have angered many people for various reasons. One, perceived insensitivity. Some view the initiative as insensitive to the concerns of striking workers and their job security. Prioritization concerns. Critics argue that the government should focus on more pressing issues like health care rather than facilitating alcohol purchases. But Doug Ford is focusing on facilitating alcohol purchases because that's something he can control. He has no answers for how to get you family doctor. Or how to make housing more affordable or actually build houses. He doesn't have answers. This he can control. This he can spin like he's making, he's making it look like he's taking some action. And working it for you and getting it done for the people. He's focusing on things he actually can control. To distract from the fact that he's got no answers or solutions or plans for the things that need to be addressed. Three, privatization fears. There are concerns that this move singles a shift towards privatizing alcohol sales, which could impact public revenues and jobs. And four, labor rights. Some see this as an attempt to, under to undermine the strike by prov providing alternative purchasing options. The broader implications. This controversy highlights the ongoing debate about alcohol sales in Ontario and the balance between public control and private sector involvement. It also underscores the challenges of navigating labor disputes while attempting to maintain services for consumers. In conclusion, while Ford's government presents the virtual map as a solution to help consumers during the LCBO strike, it has instead become a flashpoint for broader debates about labor rights, privatization, and government priorities in Ontario. And 
the thing about this map that was a really irksome to me is oh so what you mean to tell us is that you had the strategy all along to tell us for example uh put out a map uh, telling us where family doctors were taking new patients i guess that would probably be a blank map though uh or you had the technology to be able to tell parents which where they can find an air-conditioned school in their city and maybe allow their kids to enroll there so that they wouldn't bake at the end of June. Or maybe a map to places where Ontarians could uh, buy a brick of butter for fewer than a laurier. Tell us where Galen happens to have a sale going on. Maybe. Or, um, uh, gee, what else? Uh, hot spots during COVID um, where uh, youth, where there are good job opportunities for youth who are looking for jobs. Um, there are so many things uh, now that we have the technology to produce interactive maps that the government of Ontario could have used them where there are cooling centers during a heat wave or warming centers during a storm, for example. But he breaks it out for booze. He breaks it out for booze. He breaks it out to try and bulldoze over a union. Yeah, yes, 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 Kit Rhiannon. Or a map of the available places to help, whoops, help kids with autism. 70K waitlist, still growing. Yes. Absolutely. Particularly that because he seems to have a particular hate on for kids with autism for some reason. I just, we had the technology all along. You just weren't worth it. So we didn't bother. That's the, I see that and that's the message I get. You weren't worth it. Just, and then of course, we have some comments, of course, because of our, we remember that, you know, uh, alcohol stores were kept open during the pandemic because many reasons, but one of the main reasons is that uh, there's a certain percentage of the population that is alcohol dependent and uh, cutting off the supply uh, rather abruptly um, can lead to things that are not good. But now we're on strike. So I have, uh, I, I'm wondering how many grifts does this guy get? How many opportunities does he have to take an element of the public good and trash it or sell it off? I mean, there was the Greenbelt stuff. There's the Service Canada stuff. There's the Ontario Science Center where it would cost a hell of a lot more. It would have cost a lot more to fix the roof when they were told to fix the roof the first time, but then they let it go. And it's still going to cost less to fix the roof than to put it in a temporary spot for a couple of years which will still leave us without an Ontario Science Centre for a few years while that temporary place is built. There are individuals, there are private corporations that have offered money. There are more and more studies that keep on coming out showing that it's absolutely not feasible, not economically sound to do it in any other way, just fix the damn roof. But he can't. And then there's the Thermspa thing. 
which, you know, I don't know if this inspires confidence, but uh, the one in Manchester in England that was supposed to be open and opening in 2025, they haven't even started construction on it yet. That doesn't, uh, <laughs> that doesn't augur well. Uh, yep. Mishadeka or a map of all affordable housing units available or a map of affordable dentists or doctors. Yeah, the list goes, the list goes on. Oh, I just heard the thunder. Yes. Yeah, I think Beryl is here. <laughs> so, yeah. Um, I think he thought he was being clever here. Uh, but that type of thing, um, I keep on, I always come back to the Bev Oda and the $16 orange juice when these types of things happen. There are things that can happen. You know, you could, you know, Doug Ford misplaces $4 billion. Well, you know, what's $4 billion? I can't, I can't wrap my head around it. Yes. But, you know, a minister uh, gets a $16 glass of orange juice and, you know, pays to have an upgrade to her hotel room so that she can smoke in it and upgrades from whatever hotel she was to the Savoy and uh, make sure that she always books a limo. Yes. Well, when you add all that up, people can understand that. Right? If I had grandparents that were alive, my grandmother, my grandfather would be able to understand that. People who are not interested in politics would be able to understand that. You don't need a PhD to be able to understand when people seem to be living a little high off the hog, right? It's an easy message. Everybody can understand it. Everybody can see that it's wrong. This type of thing, I guess there's a strike and putting out a map saying, hey, everybody, here's where you can go get your, your booze. And everybody's turning around. It's like, uh, dude, if you've got a map that can tell people where things are, why not telling, telling, telling me something I really need? It's this backfired in all kinds of ways because they were. This strike hasn't been on for quite a long time, and they were able to, be able to like collect all that information and put it up and organize it. They did. They, they dedicated resources. They treated this like it was a priority. So, so we're all sitting here going like, okay, so now that we know that we can light a match under your ass. When you actually find another gear, this is what you do with it? Really? Yes. Yes, Kit Rhiannon. And Ford now has his old cottage listed for rental on Airbnb. <sighs> Again, I can't be grudging it. It's, own, it's, it's his own house. But I mean, it's just, again, in an era when we are uh, talking about, he goes and says, like, we need to build homes. We need to build homes. And I know it's his cottage in the Muskoka, and it's not like, you know, it's an apartment in downtown Toronto and whatnot. And, uh, but it's just like the guy that keeps on saying that we need to build homes has a cottage on Airbnb. It's just, oh. <laughs> It's like, oh man, optics, optics, people, they matter. They matter. Oh, geez. I can't believe it. <laughs> uh, now, uh, let, let's just put it this way. Um, not a lot of uh, really smart decisions, but again, this is, this is this thing, right? Where I keep on saying he is mocking us. He's laughing at us directly in our faces. He is doing it right in plain sight like this. And then he pops in front of a mic and flashes those veneers and go, gives us an aw shocks, folks. And everything's supposed to be all right. At some point, he won't be able to coast on that. I just wish it would be sooner rather than later. <laughs> uh, a bit tired of him, I have to say. I just am. All right, let's see what else do we have here. Okay, a little bit of news. 
Um, let's see. What do we got? What do we got here? Yes. Okay. Yes. Let, let's do this. Let's do this. Um, a little bit of international stuff uh, before uh, we go for the day. A um, couple of days ago was about nine months since the October 7th attack in Israel. Uh, the hostages have not yet been released, Hamas has not yet been destroyed, and the fighting continues. Uh, there has been increased talk of a ceasefire again because uh, Hamas has agreed to uh, the proposed phased ceasefire deal. And uh, the Americans say that there, have, there has been a um, substantial shift in the Hamas position uh, and that shift would be that Hamas is no longer demanding up front that Israel agree to end the war before any deal is done regarding hostages. Now, and it seems that Hamas itself is reporting this as a softening of its position. Now, there's no agreement yet, uh, but Israel has sent the, its chief of the Mossad uh, to Qatar to talk to the Prime Minister of Qatar on Friday, and there are more talks scheduled uh, this week in Cairo. Um, Netanyahu's in an interesting situation. He's facing a lot of pressure, and he's kind of being squeezed in one sense. Uh, because on one side, you have uh, all the people in the nation who are protesting him, uh, particularly uh, families of the hostages, who are saying that, um, you know, he's not doing enough, and he seems to be doing stuff that's more self-serving than focused on getting the hostages back. And then within his own current government, especially since the departure of Benny Gantz, who was uh, the more moderating force um, within the war cabinet, the war cabinet has now been dissolved. Um, but when Benny Gantz left, it made it such that um, people in his government who are even further to the right of him, like Ben Gavir, for example, uh, are the ones he now needs to keep satisfied. And they are all threatening to basically end his government if they don't give him what he wants, give them what they want. And they want, uh, they don't want a ceasefire whatsoever to be happening. Uh, now, opposition parties, however, are on the record as saying is that they would vote for a ceasefire if it came to a vote. So there's enough votes probably in the Knesset to pass the ceasefire if it was presented. But if that happens, Netanyahu basically loses his government because the people uh, with whom he is coalesced or he's aligned, who really do just want to exterminate all Palestinians and do it yesterday. Uh, so we'll never stand for a ceasefire. So um, I'm not exactly sure what it is that he is going to do uh, next, but Netanyahu says that any deal, given that Hamas has moved on that, uh, any deal would, al would have to allow Israel to return and fight until all of the goals of the war are achieved. Uh, it's been nine months and they haven't been achieved yet. And the people who he is fighting are in an open air prison. There's nowhere for them to escape. And the goals are not achieved. I don't know if there's a situation where Seoul's goals are achieved. And I'm pretty sure the region doesn't need a forever war. So, um, yeah, not quite sure how he's going to get out of that pickle, but he's in a, it, it would seem to me that his days as leader have to be numbered. He knows he can't afford to give the extreme right wing faction in his government everything that they want, because that would probably lead to losing the support of the United States in pretty much every single way possible. But he, um, uh, it being in his interest in order to keep himself out of jail, to keep this going as long as possible, is um, also not, uh, 
not conducive to peace, let's put it that way. Um, moving to the UK, um, Keir Starmer has named his new cabinet, and it seems that uh, he's making a little bit of history. Um, he named the first female counselor, uh, chancellor of the Exchequer, and I believe the first female deputy prime minister. Hmm. Coming into power and immediately elevating strong, capable, fierce women to positions of high authority and influence that they have not occupied before. I wonder from whom he got that idea. Hmm. <laughs> Uh, it seems that eight uh, former cabinet ministers from the Conservative Party had lost their seats in the election. So uh, that is a little interesting. Uh, he named uh, the Home Secretary, Yvette Cooper, and uh, she said that she will focus on boosting the border force to deal with migration rather than uh, trying uh, the route of uh, deporting people to Rwanda. Uh, which, again, uh, as we mentioned on the show, was seemed to be it was controversial and it seemed to be an action for action's sake, with very few people going, and uh, most people having come to the conclusion that uh, if you get snagged up by that program, your odds of going are actually very small, and lodges of options of or opportunities to actually get paid lodging for you while you wait for all of that process and all those appeals to take place, uh, actually is not so bad. So, um, yes, she's going to be looking at uh, handling that uh, at points of entry rather than uh, trying to ship people somewhere else uh, once they've arrived. Uh, he has also named David Lammy as his uh, Minister of the Interior. Um, so those are probably names that we're going to be hearing a lot about over the, the next little bit. Uh, and of course, uh, you know, he had a, a whole speech, of course, after uh, he won. And uh, on, his first day, on his first day of office that, uh, you know, outlined all his priorities and things of the like. Um, there is some uh, talk at the moment uh, with regard to the Canada-UK free trade deal, because uh, talks had started with that, and then they sort of uh, got stalled. Uh, the previous conservative government was not able to make a deal with Canada, which is kind of interesting because Canada is the nation, well, the advanced nation in the world, at least, that has the greatest number of free trade agreements with other nations. So uh, we are definitely a, a trading and willing nation. So uh, it becomes, again, as uh, Christia Freeland would said when she was trying to finalize the CETA free trade agreement, uh, that uh, if you can't make a free trade deal with Canada you probably can't make a deal with anyone. And the UK under the Conservatives were a nation that could not make a free trade deal with Canada. Hopefully, this will uh, change, especially since uh, relations between the Prime Minister uh, of Canada and uh, the new Prime Minister of the UK seem to be warm. Uh, the Prime Minister had uh, already uh, had a phone conversation with him, and I'm pretty sure that they will have some uh, bilateral time together uh, during this time at the NATO summit because uh, Keir Starmer is there as one of his first official duties since becoming uh, the Prime Minister of the nation. Um, in the United States, it seems that um, Ronald Rompros is trying to back away from certain positions he's taken uh, before. It seems that he's distancing himself from this thing called Project 2025, uh, which we haven't talked much about on the show, but it's essentially this um, um, right-wing conservative wet dream roadmap to how it is that uh, they would create an authoritarian state. And uh, there is a, a an excellent commercial by the Lincoln Project uh, that's been circulating on social media that's about four minutes long. Um, but you should look at it uh, because it kind of uh, um, goes through an example of how it is uh, that he could do some things that are pretty terrible and rather quickly uh, as a result. Uh, now, 
uh, as well as distancing himself from Project 2025. Uh, he has also talked about being open to placing restrictions on contraceptives. And uh, he seems to, well, sorry, not open, sorry, backing away from his pronouncements about being open to placing restrictions on contraceptives and backing away from his recently acquired pro-life stance. Uh, now, it seems that there was a meeting um, of the Republican Party to discuss the platform. And uh, you'll have to uh, remember that the, the Rep Republican Party decided that they weren't going to have a normal platform process like they normally do before conventions, but that this would be uh, whatever Trump says is the platform is the platform. And uh, that's what you will get. So essentially, um, there was a group of people that were brought together to look at it, and they had some meetings, and uh, some of the people came out. Uh, there's one lady named Gail in particular, and again, I would have showed the clip, but uh, she was like surprised and incensed that uh, they went in the meeting, but uh, they didn't want to hear from us, and they didn't want us to have suggestions. Normally, we discuss things, we debate things, and we make amendments, and they weren't addressed, interested in any of that. And I said, no, yeah, no shit, Gail, welcome to dictatorship. You don't get a say, right? R remember, for those of you who are old enough, remember those old Club Med commercials? They'd play the song, Hands Up, Hands Up, Baby, Hands Up, and it would just be the picture of like somebody laying on the beach, whatnot, like this. And they'd play the music for a little bit, and it says, this is just 20 seconds. Imagine two weeks, Club Med, right? And I'm thinking, it's like, dude, that was one committee meeting. Imagine a term that never ends. What, what, what did you think, Gail? That on the way to dictatorship, the wannabe dictator would be taking input and requests? I, 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 <laughs> man, these people. Um, so yeah, the Trump backed platform, uh, is advertised as softening abortion language. If you see other media reports, and this is Bo of the fifth column who made this, uh, observation, Republicans adopt a platform that softens stance, softens language, scaled back language. Um, and then you go to the AP. Associated Press, which again doesn't editorialize, just presents the facts, and that's he mentioned, and I too, I do too. This is one of the reasons why I like to go to AP and CP first. Um, and their title for the article wasn't uh, "Republicans Adopt Platform That Softens Stance," but rather um, "Republicans Move at Trump's Behest to Change How They Will Oppose Abortion." Now, changing how you will oppose abortion and they're backing away from their position from, on abortion or softening their position are two entirely different concepts. Only one of them can be accurate. And it's the version of the AP that is accurate. So there's no softening going on. What the bow bo, bo, uh, of the fifth column says. What's actually happening is th this is what's actually happening. This is from the platform. Quote, on the issue of life, we proudly stand for families and life. We believe that the 14th Amendment to the Constitution of the United States guarantees that no person can be denied life or liberty without due process and that the states are therefore free to pass laws protecting those rights. So basically, rather than softening the stance on abortion, that's what the Republicans seem to be saying, or what Trump seems to be saying, is that if the 14th Amendment sets something along the lines of, um, nor shall, quote, nor shall any state deprive any person of life, liberty, or property without due process of law, well, you're calling upon the Constitution, right? It doesn't get any higher than that. So, no state law can weaken the Constitution that's passed afterwards. So the Constitution is like 
if it's in there, it's like the most absolute thing. It's the most absolute take. So if you cannot deny life without due process, and the 14th Amendment guarantees that no person can be denied life without due process, the Republican angle is that terminating a fetus, fetus would be denying it a right to life without due process. So this thing that's being sold by certain media as being a softening of language is actually a doubling down because it's recognizing fetal personhood. Which, according to Bo, it's it's not more restrictive, it's the most restrictive way to go about it. And if you recognize fetal personhood in that way, well, that also has an impact on IVF. Right? Frozen embryos are humans. So what do you do with them if you don't need the embryos? Can you just destroy them? Oh, no, you're destroying the life. So, yeah. Um, according uh, to both the fifth column, he says, the, and I agree with this position as a communications person, the reason that I find this so irritating is because they didn't just come out and say it. They tried to hide it. What does that mean? It means the Republican Party knows that the American people do not want this. They know that if they put it in there directly, that they'll lose votes. So they're not representing, they're trying to rule. They're saying, quote, we know what you want, but you better just listen to your betters. We'll tell you what you need. Uh, now, on the upside, the Supreme Court in the state of Kansas just gave uh, two big wins to the pro-choice or reproductive rights movement in the state. Uh, the first was overturning a 2015 law, which was basically a law that for all intents and purposes effectively banned anything in the second trimester with exception uh, of saving the life of the mother. Uh, so uh, that's gone uh, because... Um, uh, the Supreme Court in 2019 had ruled uh, that any infringement on bodily autonomy had to, quote, withstand strict scrutiny. And in this case, with regard to this law, it did not, uh, it did not withstand strict scrutiny. The second law that got return, or overturned was a law from 2011 or 2012 that had to do with licensing for providers. And basically what the state did was create requirements that uh, made it much difficult for uh, abortion providers to operate in the state. So the Supreme Court of Kansas also knocked that down, also because it didn't withstand strict scrutiny. Now, Kansas is uh, about one of the only states in the area, in that geography in the United States, that actually does have access to choice uh, because there was a ballot measure uh, in Kansas that took place already, and uh, the people of the state voted in favor uh, of perfect uh, of protecting uh, choice in that state, so um, these types of moves are also very important for the state because uh, there is an influx of patients into the state of Kansas from surrounding states who need these types of services, and uh, to be able to make it such that. Uh, Providers no longer have to jump through all of these uh, very onerous regulatory hoops just to be able to operate will make it such that it'll be easier to have uh, the licensed providers in place to provide the service uh, for all the people that will be coming in. So this law actually has, uh, overturning this law actually does have a very practical purpose. So um, yeah, I have to uh, watch out for that to see what happens. Uh, then in a uh, in Arkansas, uh, a group 
just uh, picked up greater than 100,000 signatures to get a measure on the ballot that would basically block abortion bans before 18 weeks. Uh, there are already five guaranteed measures to be on the ballot in 2024, and that there are 11 more possible in terms of signatures acquired. Uh, I believe uh, uh, Nebraska and uh, Nevada uh, might be uh, other states uh, that are working on that at the moment. Uh, so there we go. And I think that is about the only thing I have. Um, yeah, I think that's it, Kits and Cubs. So uh, I think I'm going to wrap that up and call it a show. All right. Uh, thank you so much, Kits and Cubs. We hope that you enjoyed this episode of the Daily Beaver Morning Show. Uh, thank you for your patience uh, with me in terms of uh, having to learn the setup uh, to be able to go solo. Uh, apologies for the lack of opening and closing bumper um, because uh, I'm in my own production suite uh, and not in Mr. Grizzly's. So uh, those things are actually loaded in, in mine. So, <laughs> which is why I had to start the way that, the way that I did. Um, I will uh, be keeping you... Uh, I, I will be checking in on Mr. Grizzly to hopefully hopefully see if he's okay and uh, send you a message and uh, keep you updated. Of course, as you know, um, uh, much prefer doing this with him uh, than alone. Uh, it's much more interesting and it goes a little, it goes much more smoothly uh, as we are allowed to have uh, clips and images and all that kind of stuff. So um, I'm sorry I was not able to, to make that happen for you today, Kits. Um, I do have the technology. I've been seeing some buttons down here, but I've never used them before. So uh, I might have practiced a couple of times on my own and then learn how to figure it out uh, before uh, flying. So got to learn how to crawl before you learn how to sprint. <laughs> so uh, yes, this is my first time producing all on my own. So hopefully uh, that... Uh, that uh, it, it, did, it did go well. Um, so, and again, so we, we thank you for your patience uh, and your indulgence with uh, being a one-man show today. Uh, remember that sharing is caring and word of mouth is priceless. So uh, if you would like to tell your peeps and poops all about us, we would really like that very much. Uh, if you would like to support us, uh, I don't have the codes as well, unfortunately. So, uh, uh, I will do it all orally, and uh, hopefully we will have them with Mr. Grizzly tomorrow. But if you would like to support us, you can go to our pod page, sponsored by The Ray Girl, podpage.com, slash the true north eager beaver, lowercase letters, with a hyphen between each one of those words. And if you go there and click subscribe, when we have something fresh off the bandwidth, it comes directly to you. If you would like to support us in other ways, then make like Kit Elaine and go to the True North Eager Beaver Media Incorporated YouTube page. And there we have three buttons for you to flick. Click and lick. Like, share, subscribe. Click one, click two, click three. Have fun with it. It makes us very happy when you click our buttons. So thank you for your support. And if you would like to help us in other ways, Kits and Cubs, we have our coffee page, which is where you can find our tip jar, or we call it the emergency hydration fund, <laughs> where our friends Coffee and Caesar and Guinness is a good lad, that one, uh, all help us uh, write, produce, uh, market, bring the show to you. Uh, so if you would like to encourage us, because of course it's not free bandwidth and all that kind of stuff, and you know, it costs a little money, uh, we appreciate anything that you can donate. So uh, please make your way to coffee, ko hyphen fi dot com slash eager beaver, lowercase letters, all in one word. And if you, you leave a little something there, um, we would be very grateful. You will have our undying gratitude. Uh, I, I would promise you my firstborn, but it, I don't think that I'm likely to procreate. So it would be an empty promise. But, <laughs> but undying love, adulation, and appreciation is something your queen beaver can promise. So uh, if you have the opportunity to help, again, ko-fi.com slash eager beaver, lowercase letters, all in one word. And we thank you for everything that you're able to contribute. And if you're not able to contribute anything, that is okay too. 
because the gift of your attention is the gift we cherish the most. And we love to hear from you. So if you'd like to write to us, truenorthegerbeaver at gmail.com is our email address. Please let us know what you're thinking about uh, certain stories, how you feel about uh how the upcoming federal election. Uh, let us know if there are things about the show that you particularly like or things that you think that we can do better. Uh, you know, uh, praise your compliments, but also constructive criticism. Please be gentle. Uh, <laughs> is very much welcome. Yeah, it's your comments is how we improve. So uh, we do want to hear from you. Uh, also, you can write to us at True Eager on our X or Twitter feed, uh, directly on our YouTube page, or on Facebook at True North Eager Beaver uh, on our blog page. We try to read absolutely everything, and we're very grateful uh, when you send us story ideas and your thoughts. Uh, sometimes it makes it easy for us to prepare the show the next day, too, So, <laughs> especially if we're pressed for time. So, uh, yes, uh, it's your show, too. We love it when you participate. So thank you so very much for all that you do to support and encourage us in all the ways that you do. We, we are grateful. You are the best damn fam in all of podcasting for a reason. And it's because all you do to help us and to build community among each other. So thank you for all of that. Uh, I love you very, very, very much. Um, because democracy is something that you do, kids and cubs. Uh, Devin Haru, uh, you'll see it on our show on Friday, uh, but he's already announcing it now, uh, is uh, promoting t-shirts for our national uh, wheelchair basketball teams. Uh, they are being sold. Uh, there's a link. Um, I don't know if I can add it uh, to the mess message here, but I think I might be able to. So I, I will put it in the chat here for you if I can find it. Uh, but yes, he is uh, promoting them. Uh, the funds will go to them and our, our, our teams are very, very, very good and uh, deserve your support. So, uh, and they look really stylish and snazzy as well. So, uh, there we go. I have uh, found the thing, and here is the link. So, actually, you know what? Let's try an experiment. Because apparently, I can do video share screen. So, I'm going to try this. And uh, you tell me, Kits and Cubs, uh, whether or not you hear this and see this. All right. Do you hear any sound, Kits and Cubs? I'm not hearing anything, so I'm going to suspect that you're not either, uh, unless you tell me something. But uh, yes, uh, beautiful shirts that he that we have uh for the there we go canada wheelchair basketball uh and they're on sale uh tinyurl.com slash 368n46xf if you go there uh you can support uh with whoops i actually posted it in the show chat uh the producer's chat and not for you so there we go uh there we go um, so yeah, if you click there, you can help our, help out our wheelchair basketball team, kits and cubs. Uh, and it's well worth your money. Well worth your money. So there you go. Uh, let's see. So yeah, because democracy is something that you do as well as supporting our Paralympians. Uh, why not if you live in British Columbia, if you live in Saskatchewan, or if you live in New Brunswick, get ready for the upcoming provincial elections by either volunteering to help your preferred candidate or your local electoral body by working at a polling station, for example, becoming a scrutineer. All right, look into that. All right, kits and cubs, from the Beaver Lodge, this is your eager beaver saying it could be a tough world out there, so please be kind to and gentle with yourself. <sighs> Words of wisdom. Um, since Mr. Grizzly's not here. Um, kits and cubs, uh, as you know, uh, you may know, um, I've uh, been going through a bit of a tougher time of late. Um because life has thrown us a couple of curveballs, and I've uh, been quite over-solicited. Um, 
I have, um, I have had the good fortune uh, of being able to, um, as I described, take a machete to the things in my life and just go simplify, 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 cut, 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 in order to create myself some runway uh, to be able to get some rest and uh, find my center again. Uh, not everybody is um, has that luxury. I understand that. Uh, but if you do in any way, um, just know that if you're starting to feel overwhelmed, um, If you have the option to wind certain things down, take the option. Um, I wanted to put a good end on things, and I, uh, you know, for example, some board work that I did, I tried to stay on till the end of my term uh, to try to end things well, um, which took a lot out of me. Um, but um, oh, I just heard from Mr. Grizzly. <laughs> Sorry, dude, I slept through. My alarm was exhausted just waking up now. <laughs> I'll send him a, a note when we, uh, uh, we go off. I'm just going to send him here say, it's all good. There you go. Boom. Um, so, yeah. Uh, I tried to, to push through through the end. And while I did not do a terrible job, I did not do as good as a job as was expected and uh, I let things slip through the cracks and it was noticed. Um, I may have been able to step a step aside a couple of months before. Right. Uh, do it, you know, politely and right away. And, you know, we're in consideration. Uh, and maybe, you know what, it, it wouldn't have been a good time two months before because, you know, they would Really needed me and asked me to see if I could tough it out, or maybe they would have been able to let me go at that point. Um, but taking some time to choose yourself, even if that means disappointing uh, certain people, even if that means having to cut, um, not follow through completely on a commitment, um, so long as you don't just leave people high and dry. Um, with, uh, with very little notice, you know, unless, you know, you, you hit a crisis point and you need to do that. You just need to drop all the balls. Um, it's a gift. It's a gift that you give yourself. And, uh, once you do it, it may take a day or two, but, um, you literally do feel the, um, load light off your shoulders. So, um, yeah, you know, it's sometimes you need to pull the ripcord. So when you do, if the moment like that comes for you where you do pull it and feel no shame, right? There's nothing wrong with choosing you. Okay. Get some cubs. That's the end. Uh, I will say, Mr. Grizzly, cue the cock and hope that it will be edited in, edited in afterwards <laughs> from the YouTube channel. Uh, but get some cubs. Uh, that's the end for me. And uh, I wish you all a beaverific day. There will be no end credits and uh, no Easter egg. But I love you all very much. You all fantastic and fierce. And I will see you tomorrow. Bye, everyone. And now I'm going to see if I can leave out with a little music. <laughs>